Welcome to Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. So glad you're with us wherever you are. If you're joining us on television here in Santa Barbara, California, we welcome you at TVSB. Uh, and we welcome those of you joining us from around the world at, at all these different platforms, the YouTube channel and goodlifetelevision.org. And we've been seeing a spike recently in those of you who are joining us on the podcast. So Good Life Conversations is the podcast. Uh, any any podcast platform, if you search Good Life Conversations, you'll find us there. You can also follow us on all the social media platforms. If you go to the YouTube channel, you can watch uh, not only the long form interviews of all these amazing people, but you can also see uh, we break them up into what we call power clips, where they're kind of shorter snippets of some of the great moments from these great guests. You know, Good Life is here to to talk about and to bring to you the good stuff. I think in our day and age, we tend to get plenty of the other stuff. Um, so we're here to talk about the good stuff and to encourage you uh, to to uh, allow our guests to share their great stories. We've had folks from all walks of life, entrepreneurs and overcomers, young people, people with great life stories, uh, visionaries, public servants, athletes, coaches. It's been really a mix of of just an amazing uh, group of people. So we're so glad you're with us. As always, presented by Bunnin Chevrolet. So grateful for our friends, Leo Bunnin and the folks at Bunnin Chevrolet. So thank you as well. Uh, I'm so excited to have uh, Jordan Gray is with me today. Jordan, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah. So Jordan's joining us from River Falls, Wisconsin, a place I've never been. What's the weather like in River Falls, Wisconsin right now? Uh, right now, it's beautiful. If you had asked me about a week ago, <laughs> I might have said something different, but today it's gorgeous. Nice. Well, thank you for joining us. And, and I, and I want to, I was telling Jordan before we came on, I, it's been fun to read about her and kind of the, uh, the story that she's in the middle of. Uh, so Jordan is an American track athlete. Uh, she specializes in, in combined events and she's actually the American record holder in the women's decathlon, uh, which we'll talk about. She's the world record holder in the decathlon long jump and an Olympic trials participant in the heptathlon. So she's from Georgia, is my understanding. And uh, so this is a woman of, of deep faith. And we're going to talk about that as well. So take us back to Georgia, kind of growing up. Where, where'd you come from? Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Uh, well, my early childhood, I was in Alpharetta, Georgia, and then very early on, though, moved to Ball Ground, Georgia. It's a very small town. Um, if you blink, you'll miss it. <laughs> it's got about 2,000 people, I think, in the whole town. Um, very small, but uh, grew up on kind of a small farm, chickens, goats, all of that stuff. Um, and I was homeschooled until I went to college. Um, I had loved every second of it. Um, but it's much, um, much different being somewhere so cold. <laughs> now that I'm in Wisconsin, Georgia was always yeah. beautiful and warm. <laughs> um, but I grew up doing sports. Um, I did softball from the time my dad could get a bat in my hand, um, did basketball, um, up until my senior year of high school, gymnastics, taekwondo. I mean, I did everything. Um, and then I started track and field the summer right before my senior year. Before your senior year of high school. Yeah. Wow. And so did you find out real quick that you were like faster than everybody else or how did that work? <laughs> um, well, so when I was in school, you couldn't compete with or against any high schools. So I had to find summer leagues, uh, all sorts of things like that. Um, so I ran for an AAU club. And that AAU club was called The Heat. And I actually wasn't very fast. <laughs> um, I was pretty slow, but I could jump really well and I could throw really well. Um, so my speed came once I got to college and started some intense training. But yeah, my parents very lovingly told me that I had a much better future in track and field than any other sport. <laughs> um, so I kind of chose that senior year that instead of going to college for basketball or anything else, I would try to go to college on a track and field scholarship. Wow. And so then what? Tell us about college. So I visited a few schools. Um, I visited a few Christian schools. 
um, and a few state schools, but I ended up settling on Kennesaw State University, um, mm -hmm. partly because um, they had a great track team and the coach um, was just a nerd in the best way possible. <laughs> I'm like to know why I'm doing things. I don't like to do things just for the sake of doing them. And he had books on endocrinology and kinesiology and just all sorts of stuff that he implemented into his training, which I found very impressive. But also he told me that there was a bus in the track parking lot. And if you happen to be on that bus at 10 30 AM on a Sunday, it would drive you to church. <laughs> so um, that staff was very um, Christ oriented, even though it was a state school, which I obviously loved um so I ended up going to college there I didn't know much of what I was doing when I got to college because I had only run track and field for a year um so I can remember just little things like the coach coming up and saying we're gonna do this warm-up and when you get to the exchange zone you're gonna do this exercise does everyone understand and we were all like, yep, got it. And he'd turn around and I'd go, I don't got it. Somebody, yeah. somebody explain this to me. But I was too embarrassed to say that I didn't know what was going on. Um, so it was a bit of a transition for sure, but it was a great choice and I would definitely make it again. And what was like, I mean, what was your introduction to the decathlon and, and kind of how, how did that happen? Yeah, so in high school, um, if you run for a high school, you can't do the heptathlon or the decathlon, but you can if you do summer league, and that's all I was able to do. So um, the Heat Track Club actually was run by Kendall Williams' father. Kendall Williams is a two-time Olympian in the heptathlon, um, just awesome person, great hurdler, great long jumper. Um, and so her dad was the one that ran the club. So when I first came, I was coming from basketball and I was just in a game where I went up for a rebound, a girl pushed me across the court and I pulled a piece of bone off my ankle. I sprained it so bad, but I didn't want to stop playing. So I didn't. <laughs> and then I almost immediately sprained my other ankle. So when I showed up to my first day of track practice, I had on a boot and a brace. Um, and so the coach was like, well, I guess we can teach you how to throw. So he taught me shot put and javelin. And then when I came out of the boot and brace, he was like, oh, well, you can jump and you're kind of fast. So we're just going to have you do the heptathlon. And I was like, I don't know what that is, but okay, that's fine. <laughs> so my first track meet ever was a heptathlon. I did all seven events. I kind of thought that's what everyone did. I thought everyone did track and field. I didn't realize that some people just did one event, but my first event was the heptathlon. So that's what I went to college to do because um, I had already had experience in it and that's what I was going to be best at. So then when I got to college, another story happened where I ended up redshirting my freshman year because I injured myself. So I was watching people pole vault and I started asking my coach to teach me pole vault and he said no. So I whined for about a year <laughs> and just kept asking and kept asking him to teach me pole vault. And eventually he did. Um, and then he actually asked me to learn discus because he thought maybe I could score some points at the conference championship. So at that point, I'm basically doing a decathlon. I've added pole vault, I've added discus, and I do all the other events. So I um, just sort of started researching like why women aren't allowed to do the decathlon. Um, and I told my coach, I was like, one day I'm going to do a decathlon. And he was like, no, you're not going to do a decathlon. And I said, that's what you said about pole vault. <laughs> and now yeah. here we are, I'm a pole vaulter. <laughs> so, um, so I, you know, there weren't really many opportunities though. So he actually found the Women's Decathlon um, Association that they put on in San Mateo. So it was kind of gradual. Um, I think that because I hadn't done track and field for so long, as most people have when they're in college, that I wasn't as used to the just standard that girls aren't allowed to do this. I think that most girls grew up with that. Um, and they had it kind of already in their heads, like when they were going through high school, going through, you know, these different stages that just girls aren't allowed to do that. So they just kind of accepted it versus I didn't have a long background in track and field. So when I started looking into it and seeing the discrepancies, I was more so like, no, this is wrong. Like, I'm going to do the full thing. Um, so that's kind of the long story of how that happened. But it was kind of a gradual thing that happened almost starting since high school. Wow. And so then, so then you began to compete um, in the decathlon. What what are those competitions, or how does that work? So, in the NCAA, you're not allowed to do the decathlon if you're a girl. 
in the U.S. championships, you're not allowed to do the decathlon if you're a girl, and the same with the Olympics, you're not allowed to. Um, but the IAAF, which is the uh, sort of the federation that makes up the points tables and they ratify results and those sorts of things, they knew that the women's decathlon would eventually come. So they had already made a points table and ways to ratify results and all of those things. So um, competitions are allowed to host them, just not the NCAA Olympics or U.S. championships. So they have a few decathlons every year. There's going to be one um, this year in San Ma or not San Mateo in uh, at Mount Sac in August. There's going to be one over Memorial Day in Florida, um, and there's even going to be one in France. And they happen in Europe a lot more than they happen in the US. So they are contested, women do do them. You're just not allowed to do them at the highest levels or in the NCAA. Yet, right? I mean. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that we're heading that direction here. I mean, that, that it seems ridiculous to me, but. <laughs> um, so, so just, let's just talk to the person like me that doesn't know anything about track and field. So the, de the, the decathlon, is 100 meter dash, long jump, shot put, high jump, 400 meter dash, hurdles, discus, pole vault, javelin, and 1500 meter run. Is that right? Yes, sir. So yeah. you do them all, and then there's a point system that grades you in each one, and then the combined is the winner? Yeah, so it's really cool how the combined events works because it doesn't care really what place you get until the very end. So if I run 13.5 seconds in the hurdles, the points table doesn't care if that was first, last, somewhere in the middle. It just says 13.5 seconds is worth this many points. So every single event is contested that way. And then at the end, you're right. All the points are added up. And then the highest total is the one that wins. And so when what, what did you win? Like what competition did you win to become, to, to know that or... or... I mean, you're the American record holder in this. I mean, we're talking to yeah. him. So, when, um, when did you do that? So I did it twice. I did it once in 2019 out in San Mateo. And then I did it again in 2021 out in San Mateo. Um, there's a Women's Decathlon Association, and they actually put on a track meet where they make sure that all of the facilities are up to IAAF standards where just little things like the pits are full, the officials are there to ratify results, you know, just all of those things that you need. Um, so they kind of put on the meet, they made sure it was world-class and that's where a bunch of us women went and competed. And that's where I got the American record. Wow. So what is this going to look like now? I mean, there's an Olympic games here in 2024, then there's an Olympic games in LA in 2028. Um, is, is somebody thinking about, is, is there a committee that's actually thinking about putting this in? Yeah, so um, it's really cool. We actually have a petition on letwomendecathlon.org that has about 30,000 signatures, uh, which is incredible. Um, and because of that, there's been a lot of noise within world athletics. So everywhere else in the world calls track and field athletics. They don't really call it track and field. So world athletics is world track and field. Um, and so there's been talk about adding it into the world championships. And so if that happens, then there would almost be no choice, but to also add it into the Olympics. Um, so a few of those higher up people have gotten lots of presentations, lots of polls, lots of, um, different conversations going about what that would look like to add it in. But the conversation is to add it in, um, slowly, but surely into those higher level competitions. So that way it is allowed in the Olympics. And you would do it. I mean, in 2024, if they put it in the Olympics, you would compete? I would try. So there's different standards you have to hit um, in order to go to the Olympics. So they would have to put a standard for what women would have to hit to be allowed in. And then at the U.S. trials, you would have to hit those standards or get top three at that competition. So if they did, hopefully I would hit that standard and hopefully I would get top three at that competition. Um, and if I did, then yes, me and whoever else would be able to go to the Olympics. Wow. So let women decathlon.org. Yes, sir. Okay, so, 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 so that's a starting point for people. The people need to go there, sign the petition, 
so that we can drum up some, you know, pressure here, right? Yes, please do. We're doing a lot of things like that petition. And then we're also hosting a camp out in, uh, out in California for um, high schoolers, elementary students, and um, just lots of different people to come try a decathlon for fun and learn what it's all about um, to help yeah. raise awareness. Lots of little things like that that are really helping get more signatures, but also just get more people behind the movement in general. Where's the camp? Um, it's going to be in California at Palos Verdes High School. Okay, there it is. So if you are near Palos Verdes High School or you know high school or or a young person who would be interested, it's June 24th and 25th. Um, Jordan will be there. You can register. So there's all kinds of information here we can give, but um, but but for sure I would encourage people to sign this petition at letwomendecathlon.org. Um, and because that, that's, that sounds great. I want to talk about your faith a little bit. So the, the, you, it sounds like you were raised by pretty incredible parents to start with, um, start there, talk a little bit about your parents and then kind of a little bit about your faith journey. Yeah. I mean, my parents are amazing. I say all the time that I want to grow up to be my mom. Um, <laughs> my dad was the youngest of eight kids. Um, and he got to go to college because he got good enough at baseball. Um, he went through a lot of hard things in his life that both challenged his faith, but then I think also made it stronger. Um, his dad died when he was nine, and then his mom died when he was 10, and he was mm -hmm. raised by his sister. Um, lots of hard work to get to where he is today. Um, my mom was very good at sports, and she was raised um, mostly by her mom, who um they did church. They did all those things. My mom really, um, I think, dove into her faith more so in college um, when she and my dad, where she and my dad met. Um, and so my parents were very strong Christians um, before I was born. I'm the oldest of four um, and they still are, but they definitely raised us um, wanting to know why we believed what we believed. Um, there wasn't a lot of, well, we just go to church because that's what we're supposed to do, or we do this because we have to, or you do this to be a good person. There was none of that. It was um, a lot of relational building um, with my parents. Like they are the same people on Sunday as they are Monday morning. Like my parents are the same in public as they are when we're back home. Um, and I didn't realize how special that was until I got older. Um, so when my mom, you know, my mom played piano in church, um, my entire life growing up. And so when my mom was up there talking about Jesus and singing about Jesus and playing about Jesus, that was the same mom that on Tuesday morning, when we we're having a hard time. Like she would talk to us about the Bible or she would, you know, sing songs in the house or she would. So I never felt like what my parents did was not authentic. And I think that bled over to me and my siblings, um, just living an authentic faith life. Um, so whenever I was having a hard time or going through things, like my parents always relied on Jesus and they kind of taught me to do the same. Um, so I got saved when I was seven. And when I was seven, it was more so just like a Wednesday night and the pastor was talking and I was like, well, I love Jesus and I don't want to go to hell. So I guess I get saved. Like that's what happens next. Um, it was a very logical decision for me, even at seven years old. <laughs> um, and then as I got older, I really started diving into, well, why do I believe this and not in the Islam faith? Why do I believe this and not in the Buddhist faith? Like what makes us different? Um, and I started doing that from a, a very young age, like fifth grade. I started mm. asking those questions and my parents were always there ready to answer. Um, which I think was a big deal because I was a very curious child. <laughs> um, but it definitely made me a stronger Christian to have parents who had those answers, um, for sure. And then just the more that I prayed, the more that I dove into my Bible, the more it became a, a relationship that I couldn't deny. Um, like I, I talk to him daily and that's something that can't be taken away um, or argued away. Um, so my parents were amazing. I got saved again, very young. And then I've just kind of continued to grow in that faith. And I've definitely had hard, hard challenges and hard times, but, um, 
it's amazing looking back how much Jesus was there and then how much I'm able to share him through those hard times with other people who are going through similar things. Mm, wow. So just real quick, how did you end up in Wisconsin? Just, I, I, I wanted to know that for, real quick. Um, so professional track and field athletes don't go join a league like the NBA or anything like that. They tend to follow good coaches. Um, so my coach from Kennesaw state actually took a job in Wisconsin. So I followed him here to continue training. Ah, got it. Okay. Well, yeah. And I read, you know, I read one of the things you uh, quote from you, you know, and you said, I trust that God's hand is in everything that I do and remind myself to treat others like someone Jesus loved and died for. And I thought, wow, what a wonderful thing that is. Um, talk about kind of as a, as a, as a young person who's, you know, um, obviously, you know, the world is, is kind of crazy and, and kind of getting crazier. I mean, it's, 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 it's not an easy time. I'm, I'm just saying this as a parent, you know, it's not an easy time to, to, uh, you know, to come up uh, in this day and age with just, you know, it, it wasn't like this when I was coming up, I'll just put it that way. How, how does your faith kind of steady you? Um, Cause it sounds to me like the, your faith is really kind of your center. Talk about that as a young person, because this is something I've thought a lot about, you know, is there's so many things now, distractions and in terms of social media and different, you know, the gadgets and the, you know, the stuff that can take up time, you know, can occupy young people. But my mm -hmm. concern, I'm not against social media at all. I love it. I, we use it. It's powerful. It's a great way to reach people. It's a great way to have, have a positive impact. So I'm not against any of that, but it's not the center of people's life. You know, the, the problem is if, if these things become a center, I read this morning, a quote, somebody said, um, you know, don't, center or base your life on something that you could lose <laughs> you know um and so i think a lot of these things it's 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 consuming of time but it's not a good center you know just like money money is great it's not a good god <laughs> it's great to be used it's not a good god um so talk about your center cuz and, and how that works for you as in a way that you know it might be encouraging to a young person who's watching this yeah, I mean, even as a parent, right, like you're saying, I think that every generation probably feels like there's something going on that they don't want to raise their kids in, like, even in the 60s, right, we think about the good old days, but you know, there's Woodstock, and there's like the sexual revolution and all these things happening. And I think parents are worried about raising their kids through that just as much, you know, as people are worried about raising their kids through the day of social media. And I think I saw a quote one time that said, um, don't be ashamed of raising dragon slayers in a world where there's actual dragons. Yeah. <laughs> and I love that. Yeah. Um, because I feel like that's what um, is so hard to do. But I think that you just have to choose your heart. You know, it's hard to raise good godly kids, but it's also hard to have bratty kids. It's also hard to have kids that have strayed away. It's hard to stay rooted in your faith, but it's much harder when you've strayed away from your faith. Um, so I think sometimes you just have to choose what's going to be hard. Um, but just from my perspective, um, I think that a lot of the reason that my faith has keep, kept me so grounded is because I don't look to the world for truth. Um, I think I got taught at a very young age that there are lots of different opinions in the world there are lots of things people are going to say and mm -hmm. some of it's good some of it's bad but whether or not it's truth really depends on how it lines up with the bible mm -hmm. um and how it lines up with christ and i think that that's a big thing that gets missed nowadays i think there's a lot of um talk like well my truth is well your truth is well and that's so dangerous um because there's only one truth and truth is something that aligns up with reality. And it has nothing to do with the way that we're feeling. It has nothing to do with the words other people put on us. It has nothing to do with what the devil sneaks into your mind. Um, and if you can't rely on truth, if truth is subjective, if truth is wishy-washy, if 
truth is just what the majority says, just the majority of people think this, so that's truth, then truth isn't something you can rely on. Um, but when you yeah. realize that truth is Jesus, that truth is the word of God, um, truth is that faith, then it's much easier to come back to. It's that solid rock. You don't worry about it ever changing. Um, and so I think just when you do go through hard times, when you do have things that are going wrong in your life, you don't look to social media. You don't even necessarily look to your parents, even though they're great people. You don't look to these other things to find um, your identity in. Um, I think that's another thing. I always joke around about how I hate that people like will say, oh, well, you're a student athlete because you're a student first, then you're an athlete. And I always used to make fun of that because I was like, that's not how English works. <laughs> you don't say it's a blue house because it's blue first, then it's a house. I'm like, no, you always put the adjectives first. But then I found myself doing that to me. I'd say I'm a Christian athlete. Well, I'm not a Christian athlete because to say that would it be like I'm a tall athlete or I'm a fast athlete or I'm a track athlete. And my identity isn't that I'm an athlete. My identity is that I'm rooted in Christ. Um, and so I think it's much more fitting to call people athletic Christians or artistic Christians or governing Christians or whatever you want to call, you know, the thing that they do, but we're not our gifts. We're not our talents. We're not the sums of all the goods and the bads that we've done. You know, we are rooted in Jesus. And when you're a Christian and that's where your life is rooted, then when something gets taken away, <laughs> it's not where your happiness lies. It's not where your identity lies. And I think that hurts a lot of people when they come out of professional sports, they don't know what to do with themselves. They don't know where to turn. They don't know what to do with their lives now. And I think that when that's not who you are, it's much easier. And when you know who you are, then no matter what you see on social media, no matter what other people tell you, no matter what goes on around you or what gets taken away from you, then you are so rooted in Christ that you are still you and you are still the same person that came in and out of that situation. That's so good. Wow. Do you speak, by the way? <laughs> um, I've given a TED talk once, um, but I, not a ton. I should speak more. <laughs> I think you I've, should. I've... <laughs> no, for sure you should. That's powerful what you just said. I mean, that's... that's uh... That's really powerful identity. And speaking of, you know, just this, in this time, kind of day and age, I mean, in the in a day and age of great noise, a lot of messaging tell you, telling you who you are or who you aren't oftentimes, mm -hmm. man, what a, it's, it's a confusing thing, but, but, but the truth is the truth, you know, and that's, that's a, yeah, that's fantastic. Favorite verse, Ephesians 2, 8. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it's a gift of God. Yes, it is. We're, we're out of time, but what a wonderful thing that is. Um, Jordan, wow. Uh, and you're working uh, you're, you're working as part of the, the heaven, heaven to the hour. Yeah, is, is that what the, because we've had a couple, yeah, exactly. I need this secret hint. Heaven to the yeah. Uh, we had Christian Taylor and a couple couple others, I think, that were talking with what a wonderful idea this is to to reach out to athletes and to do the kind of stuff that you're doing it was a great idea cat had a great vision and it's definitely coming uh to fruition in ways that i think that she even didn't expect and it's it's amazing yeah fantastic all right well everybody let women decathlon.org go sign the petition jordan gray has been our guest american record holder in the women's decathlon we are grateful to meet you and we wish you all the best thank you so much it was great being here thanks jordan and thank you for watching we'll see you next time <laughs>